Welcome, everybody. Uh, it is so exciting to be doing what I can't believe is the 2021 mid-year compliance update. Uh, time really is flying, even during this pandemic. Um, I'm Marjorie Robertson, uh, Sun Life's Employment Council, but also quite involved in our leave and absence and ADH services. And presenting with me is Abby O'Connell, also an attorney uh, and very involved in our absence services. So for those of you who have not heard us before, welcome. For those of you who have, you kind of know what to expect. Uh, a few things just to point out. We will uh, we'll have a lot of information on the slides, but I don't want people to panic when they see them. We do not read the slides. We try very hard not to be boring. Uh, that's probably our number one goal during this. We also have a lot of hyperlinks in the slides. Our view of the slides is that they should not just be talking points for us. They should be useful resources for you for when we're done. So um, we look forward to this and we hope to keep it as uh, entertaining as it is educational. And my clicker is not working. <laughs> You're already starting with the entertainment. There we go. Wait, okay, so our agenda today, uh, we're gonna talk about vaccination and masks, COVID-19 leave issues, uh, an update on paid sick leave laws and PFML laws, an update on other leave laws, and then um, we always enjoy sharing some recent jury trials and settlements with you. So we are gonna start with a poll question. And our first question for you, there's two throughout the presentation is, are you, um, Oh, I have the wrong pull up. We're off to a brilliant start here, Marge. <laughs> the question is, are you still requiring masks in the workplace? And I'm going to launch the poll. And if you could uh, make a selection, I'll give everyone a, a few seconds to make their selection. I would say that as of today, um, Sun Life is still requiring masks in our workplaces when people are on site. Um, but we expect that that will be an evolving position um, as things develop and as more and more people have access and are vaccinated. So I'm gonna um, give everyone three more seconds to answer. We've got a great response rate so far. Then we can take a look at our poll result, results. And it looks like we have a real mixed bag um, of results on this one. So I'm gonna give it three more seconds and then I'll stop the poll because numbers are keep rolling in. I'm gonna end the polling. I'm gonna share the results. And Marge, you can see it's a real mixed bag. So we have about 12% of employers here um, who say masks must be worn at all times. We've got 35% uh, percent, there it says employees uh, who, are vaccinate, who are not vaccinated must wear masks um, and a little bit in each category. So it's definitely each workplace is facing their own challenges, making their own decisions in this regard. Well, that was great. Um, we are here, what we've been amazed at is even as we've been getting ready for this, things are changing at a rapid clip. Um, I have a saying that the sands are shifting with regard to COVID-19. Um, I also have a saying that it seems like COVID-19 is almost over. So um, vaccinations just are really shaking it up. They're changing everything. Uh, we went from these super cautious government announcements for over a year and a half, and now suddenly the CDC caution to the wind, if you're fully vaccinated, no physical distancing, no mask wearing required, except when there are specific federal, state, local, territorial laws that require it. Um, OSHA was a little bit behind the CDC. The CDC made this announcement a little while ago. OSHA finally, on June 10th, uh, they issued their own rule, which is, well, unless these local, federal, state, tribal, territorial rules provide otherwise, we're really not worried anymore about people who are vaccinated and you employers don't need to worry about them either. Um, OSHA now is focused only on those who are not vaccinated or otherwise at risk or on health healthcare workplaces are still um, getting attention from OSHA. The other thing they did is they revoked, they had a very short lived requirement that if you were going to mandate a vaccine, you had to report adverse reactions. They have now revoked that requirement. So as Marge said, vaccinations are changing everything as evidenced by this reopening map of the United States. And you can see here that the states in the lighter teal color um, are, are, have gone through reopening. 
Um, states in the darker blue are set to reopen this month. Um, states in yellow are set to reopen in July. Um, this, the states in the darker gray, which you'll see here are New Mexico and Oregon, they have criteria to reopen, but no set date. And just for reference, New Mexico plans to reopen once 60% of eligible residents um, have been fully vaccinated. And Oregon is set to reopen once 70% of residents age 18 and older have received at least one of the vaccination shots. Oregon um, originally said that you had to have 70% of residents age 16 and older, and then they retracted that and made it 18 plus. Um, you might be able to see Puerto Rico has no criteria or set date to reopen, but this is just kind of you know, an interesting implication that things are really changing now. And if we look at the next slide, um, this is a reflection of the mask requirements. Uh, so you'll see that there's no restrictions in the lighter teal states and that there's restrictions that are ma you know, masks required for um, unvaccinated people indoors in the, in the bluer states. And then the, Hawaii and Puerto Rico still have a mask mandate for everyone indoors. Um, so in, it, in just to note that masks can be required um, for everyone in certain settings. And then New York uh, had a big fireworks celebration because they have hit 70% um, of vaccination and they are reopened. So I think New York is sort of symbolic in the whole COVID pandemic because they were hit hardest and originally out the gates uh, last March, March 2020, and they are officially reopened. So we wanted to celebrate that here. Yeah, I, I had to laugh. New York does everything in style. So <laughs> um, so there have been changes in other state requirements, um, even, I mean, COVID really does feel like it is starting to be over. Even some of the more uh, conservative states, not in the traditional sense, but in the sense of taking extra precautions about COVID have started to loosen up. New Jersey is taking kind of an interesting approach. You know, you're you're not mandated. Employers are not required to make employees wear face masks um, if there's proof of vaccination. If but if there isn't proof of vaccination, then the employers must continue to require. Another common requirement in some of these states is that you can't prevent somebody from wearing a mask if they want to wear a mask. And Oregon and Washington have issued similar orders. So California has been interesting. Cal OSHA and the California Department of Public Health um, have not, I guess I would use the term, not been in alignment with some of their rules uh, regarding COVID restrictions. And um, California Department of Public Health has actually said that no masks are required for fully vaccinated um, persons except in limited settings like healthcare settings, public transportation, homeless shelters, emergency shelters. Um, Massachusetts uh, has rescinded their mask order as of um, May 29th. We'll talk a little bit more about Massachusetts later. Um, there's also a lottery in Massachusetts uh, for the vaccinated. Connecticut also um, has, has rescinded their, their mask order on May 19th um, in that people are not required to wear masks indoors, but unvaccinated individuals must still wear masks. Um, Notably in Connecticut, businesses have the option to require that mask be worn by everyone in certain establishments. Um, and so it's just interesting because there's a lot of state law variety regarding the dates the mask orders were rescinded. Okay, it's not turning. <laughs> All right, let me, I had to now try to find the little arrow. Um, there we go. There we go. Mandatory vaccines. Um, so there, there is news here. Um, if you had talked to me two months ago, I would have been much more circumspect about whether vaccines can be mandated, but it feels like the push at the federal government with all of their changes saying, if somebody's vaccinated, you don't have to worry about them. If I were an employer, I would be thinking, you know, my life would be a lot easier if I just mandated vaccines. I wouldn't have to worry about anything. Um, so I think we may start to see that trend shifting. I think originally employers were hesitant to mandate. So the first hurdle to cross is the fact that the three vaccines are still just in the emergency use authorization stage. And in that stage, you, the, if the government is administering them, they have to get very express consent. It can't be mandated, it has to be voluntary. So some employees have brought suits and they're indicated at the bottom saying, well, it's a violation of the emergency use standards if my employer tries to mandate that I get the vaccine. 
Uh, there was a, the 117 employees, as you can see, sued Houston Methodist Hospital, and that, that case got resolved very quickly. Um, on a motion to dismiss, the federal court uh, ruled, no, your employer can mandate you. The fact that there is an emergency use authorization limitation on the Food and Drug Administration or on governments doesn't mean that your employer can't mandate it. Your employer can absolutely mandate it. It's kind of a scathing opinion um, that, that you can see if you go on that hyperlink. Um, so I think this emergency use issue is going to turn out to be a non-issue. There we go. So in uh, in relation to like you know federal level guidance on vaccine mandates, the CDC has released guidance saying that um, the issue about mandating vaccines should be determined under state law. So they've sort of backed away um, from from providing any guidance on this issue. Um, on uh, in late May, the EEOC revised its guidance, um, making clear that it is beyond the jurisdiction to their their jurisdiction to discuss the implications of the EUA uh, vaccines. And one thing I think, you know, Marge and I always talk about common sense compliance is that, you know, as an employer, you've got to make sure that you have reasonable accommodations for potentially employees who are not able to get a vaccine or employees who have sincerely held religious beliefs that would prevent them from getting the vaccine. Um, but you also want to be mindful that you may have employees who have received the vaccine but still want some accommodation related to COVID-19. Um, so perhaps you may have employees who've been vaccinated, but they're taking immunosuppressants and they still want to be able to wear masks or physically distance. So we've put some more common reasonable accommodations related to COVID on the, the right side of this slide. And just something to keep in mind, you know, even with people who have vaccines, they still may want accommodations to help them um, in the workplace in, in light of COVID. So the EEOC, uh, they updated their guidance uh, very recently um, and, and really became much more pro-vaccine. Um, and they do, they've issued a number of things that should be comforting to employers. You know, requiring the vaccine itself is not considered a medical examination under the ADA. Um, you have to be careful with the pre-screening questions. So if you're going to be administering the COVID vaccine yourself or at your direction or in your workplace, and there are required medical questions that have to be asked, that could get very tricky in terms of the um, ADA. The vaccination results, you can require them. That's another thing. The EEOC has said that requiring proof of vaccine is not a disability-related inquiry. Again, the follow-up questions might get you into trouble, like, well, why didn't you get the vaccine? Um, and if you get that information, you do have to keep it confidential, separate from the personnel records. Another thing the EEOC has come right out and said is, you know, it's okay to give incentives for people to get vaccines. Uh, you can even give them, I, I had to reread this this morning, you can even give an employee incentive to show that their family member has been vaccinated. Uh, that is not a violation of GINA. Um, Sun Life has not been asking us whether our family members are vaccinated, but I, I guess there could be some employment situations where you would want to, but the, the EEOC is going all in on this vaccine. Marge, I don't think Sun Life's going to be having to bring your kid to work day any day <laughs> soon to that point. As the mother of young children, I know mine are not of the age where they can be vaccinated yet. Um, so I will say that uh, the Flo Florida's Governor DeSantos, uh, his big fight with the cruise industry has provided some much needed entertainment in the past month. Um, but essentially, there's a, there has been this sort of flurry of laws proposed that would prohibit a vaccine mandate. So we talked two slides ago about how there's not real clarity at the federal level on whether or not you can mandate an EUA status vaccine for your workforce. Um, but there, there is some state law activity in this area in that Florida actually prohibits businesses from requiring, and, and this is, goes beyond just employer employee relationship, but Florida has passed a, a law prohibiting businesses from requiring patrons and customers to show proof of vaccination to gain access or entry to the business. Um, and so, so this, while it doesn't strictly address employee employer rights, it is, it is notable that this has happened, especially because the cruise industry was impacted in that they uh, had to have a certain amount of vaccinated passengers to be able to sail. Um, Georgia, Iowa, Montana, and Texas have all adopted laws placing limits on vaccine mandates. 
um, and or uh, mandated disclosure of vaccine, vaccine status. And then these other states, and as Marge mentioned earlier, we have a ton of hyperlinks in our presentation. These are states where we've seen um, proposals, proposed legislation to limit vaccine mandates um, and to prevent discrimination against employees who, who do not get vaccinated. Um, so it's, it's definitely an interesting developing new area of the law. So uh, on the other hand, uh, the health officer of Santa Clara County, California, issued an order requiring businesses and governmental entities within its borders to determine whether their personnel are fully vaccinated by June 1st, and then they have to update it uh, at two-week intervals after that. And they have to keep adequate records. Um, and in this county, at least, until your vaccination status is ascertained, you have to be treated as though you have not been vaccinated. And so people can decline to provide their status, but they will be treated as though they are unvaccinated. I, I have not seen any other jurisdiction follow this rather aggressive approach. <laughs> So with that, we're going to move into our COVID-19 uh, leave-related update. And Marge, if you can skip right to the next slide. Um, if you've attended some of our past webinars, we've talked about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which was the first federal paid leave mandate. And that happened in 2020, and that law has since expired. But what has occurred since is that um, they've passed the, Biden has passed the American Rescue Plan. And what this does is it provides paid sick leave and paid family leave for reasons that were covered under the FFCRA and some additional reasons. However, this is not a mandated leave law. So this allows employers to grant leave for these set of reasons and then seek tax credits um, in the amount of, of benefits that they have paid out for these paid leaves. Um, the American Rescue Plan applies to employers with fewer than 500 employees. Um, this, Marge is gonna talk about the paid family medical leave portion of it on the next slide, but the paid sick leave portion allows the employee to take up to 80 hours of time. And this is a fresh entitlement beginning April 1st, anytime through the end of September. And again, this is a voluntary. So if it's offered, the employer can seek a tax credit. Um, in addition to the, the reasons covered under the original FFCRA, leave can be taken to receive a vaccine or to recover from the side effects of receiving a vaccine or to await test results, um, whether or not it's been a voluntary test or a test due to exposure or at the employer's request. Um, the, it, so the leave, if the leave is taken for the employee's own health condition, right, for them to receive the vaccine, recover from the, the side effects or recover from COVID, the benefits are paid at the employee's regular rate of pay up to $511 a day. If the leave is taken for a caregiving reason, so perhaps the employee is taking care of a family member, um, the benefits are paid at two thirds of the employee's regular rate of pay and they're capped at $200 a day. So the American Rescue Plan um, also sort of dramatically changed the paid FMLA part of it under the uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, as we call it, the FFCRA. Uh, the only reason that the family and medical leave part was available, that's the 12 weeks as opposed to the two weeks, was if your uh, child's school or place of care was closed and you needed to take care of them and that included remote learning. Well, in the American Rescue Plan, they kind of blew that up. And now they, the extended FMLA is available for all of the reasons, including the new reasons that are the vaccine related. They also created a new allotment and they said that it'll be 12,000 per employee, which eliminates the first 10 days being unpaid. Um, and again, this is from April 1st until September 30th. The amount you can be reimbursed is to a two thirds rate up to $200 per day. So we put this slide in and I'm not gonna go through every state detail, but just to talk about the, the fact, and, and Marge, I don't know if you would disagree, but I think when COVID first struck, we all thought this was gonna be a passing situation. We didn't realize in 2021, we'd still be dealing with this. So I know originally New York's law actually set the maximum benefit based on the 2020 uh, maximum under their state paid family leave benefit. I don't think they had any thought that this would be going into 2021. So we wanted to put together this slide to reflect 
that many of these state and local leave requirements are con continuing into 2021 and that you should be aware of them. So despite the fact that the American Rescue Plan can um, offer leave, you know, employers can voluntarily offer it, employers, depending on where they operate, may be subject to some of these state and local mandates to offer COVID-related leave. So we put these in here, there's a lot of hyperlinks, but you can see you know, the, that these all extend the mandates of the leave. So there's also been some activity in terms of laws requiring paid leave for vaccines. New York was the first to kind of jump on that bandwagon requiring up to four hours paid leave per dose. Chicago then went at it a different way. They, um, they went at it with an anti-retaliation. They also said that if the employer is gonna mandate the vaccine, then they have to provide four hours of paid leave per do dose. Uh, Nevada just recently jumped <laughs> onto this bandwagon and it is requiring um, employers to provide paid time off for uh, getting the vaccine. So Massachusetts <laughs> recently passed a COVID-19 paid sick leave mandate. And I kind of joke about this because our state has achieved very high vaccination rates. I think we're the, the third uh, in relation to all 50, you know, 51 states and territories in the United States, we're third for the percentage of, uh, employ uh, percentage of persons vaccinated. Um, but we have a new COVID-19 paid sick leave mandate. Um, and what this does is that it requires employers to provide 40 hours of job protected leave to full time employees and, and there would be a proration for part time employees um, for uh, COVID related reasons. And this mandate is in place through the end of September and employers have to provide leave if the employee has to self isolate due to diagnosis of COVID if they are going to seek diagnosis if they need immunization if they're caring for a family member who's uh, isolate in isolation due to COVID or is diagnosed with COVID and needs treatment um, because of quarantine order or if the employee is sick with COVID and unable to telecommute due to their illness um, so what's interesting about this uh, paid sick leave entitlement is it's on top of in addition to our state's earned sick leave law. So Massachusetts is one of the states that has a mandated sick leave law, and this is an additional entitlement. Um, so you wanna be careful about that. Um, also employers can seek reimbursement out of a COVID-19 emergency paid sick leave fund that the state has set up. If they do have um, employees who qualify for this and they are providing the benefits, you wanna be sure you track it if you're giving time under this mandate. Um, last but not least, uh, if the employer has set up a separate COVID-19 sick leave policy, many employers have policies in place where they'll provide proactively sick time to employees for these covered reasons, then they can be deemed to be in compliance with the law if they offer the ability to take leave for all the reasons covered under this new Massachusetts mandate. Uh, got the the minute you look away, you lose the, the progression. I did. I Now I got to find the arrow to it. There we go. Okay. So now we're going to give you updates on um, paid leave laws, on non-COVID paid leave laws, paid sick leave um, and paid family leave. And we're, Abby's going to do our second poll. So our second, so our second poll question is, do you support the creation of a national paid family and medical leave program? And I'm going to launch the poll right now um, and hopefully you can all answer this is an interesting question and marge and i have done a lot of work in this area and on the one hand it would be nice if we had one national standard um, but at this point in time and we'll talk about this in future slides there's so many existing state mandates the national standard would sort of have to account for what happens to those states that already have programs in place so it's a bit of a tricky issue on the one hand it adds some simplicity um, on the other, it might have impact for states who are already operational. And I know I'm, people are frantically responding to this poll, so I'm going to give it a few more seconds. Um, but it's definitely been an interesting, um, also in the in the fact that in the past eight years, is you know the Republicans and Democrats have been talking about the potential need and the need for paid family leave and how to go about achieving it at a federal level. And we've seen you know, legislation proposed from both Republicans and Democrats in this area. 
So we have our answers are starting to slow a bit. I'll give three more seconds for those who are answering to answer. And I'm gonna um, end this poll and I'll share the results. And again, we have a bit of a mixed bag on this. Hmm. Um, so the, the answers were yes, a national PFML program is needed. And we got about a quarter of participants um, supporting that. Yes, but only if the national program preempts all the state and local paid leaves. The, the biggest majority there are 33%. Uh, no, 20%, and undecided, no opinion, 21%. Marge, any thoughts on this? It is kind of an interesting split. Um, I, I guess we should have anticipated it, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what to take away from it. So how's that for a lack there of an answer? <laughs> <laughs> So I think this is the part, Marge, where you and I get confused because I do two slides in a row. So we are going to talk a little bit about existing paid sick leave laws. And I get a lot of questions when one of these laws passes. And I think there's in general a lot of confusion between paid sick leave laws and paid family and medical leave laws. So the way that I think about them is that paid sick leave laws often mandate a certain amount of days or hours of paid time off, whereas paid family and medical leave typically requires a certain amount of weeks of time. And paid family medical leave is typically paid at a percentage of the employee's earnings, whereas paid sick leave laws are often, uh, the employee receives their full pay and not just a percentage. So I try to, we try to differentiate them when we talk about them. Um, they have different impacts. Uh, the reason that you know, it matters to, to Sun Life is that the paid sick leaves are often managed by employers along with their paid time off programs whereas paid family and medical leaves are state mandated and there's a lot more regulation there and they're typically either outsourced or participating in a state run program. Um, so with that uh, sort of framework for how we think about it, there have been a lot of changes in the paid sick leave space in the past year. I do think that COVID kind of illustrated the importance and the need for the availability of paid sick time so that employees wouldn't be coming into work and spreading the virus. Um, what's interesting about the mandates that exist today is that they exist at the state, city, and sometimes county level. Um, so it can be a little bit confusing there. New Jersey had originally had a bunch of um, local paid sick leave laws and their state law actually preempted the local laws. Um, California and Washington did not take that path. California and Washington have both state level and then local paid sick leave mandates. Um, so you have to just be aware of that depending on where you have employees and where you operate. Um, there are three states that actually have laws that say if you offer paid sick leave, you have to make it available for broader reasons. Um, so those are interesting to keep, you know, to keep in mind if your employee needs time off for reasons other than their own sickness or their family member's sickness. Um, Maine and Nevada, they have just paid time off laws. Um, so they're general paid time off laws. Um, just noting on the left side of the slide, you'll see the two newest paid sick leave laws at the state level in Teal. Um, Nevada allows up to 40 or mandates 40 hours for any reason, not just sick leave for employers with 50 or more employees. And Maine is effective 1121, um, and it applied to employers with 10 or more in that, and that they have to provide one hour per 40 hours worked up to 40 hours total of paid leave. So um, there was a lot of activity in the paid sick leave uh, space in 2021. I, I actually thought there would be more of these laws passing than did, and it was clearly a response to COVID-19. Uh, New Mexico did pass, it's a general paid sick leave law. Virginia is a very narrowly focused one on home healthcare workers. Um, what we saw happening in 2021 was this, now that paid sick leave laws are being introduced, they're including a public health emergency leave reason for school closure, illness, quarantine orders. Before COVID-19, there actually were a couple of, of paid sick leave laws that had it, but they were, they were by far the, the exception. And now I think it's becoming much more... Um, understood <laughs> that this really can happen and is needed. Um, in addition, we're seeing more and more proposals to include domestic violence, sexual assault, stocking leave, um, and then definitely in laws all over the place, you're gonna hear about it more in slides we discuss later, the definition of family member is being broadened 
Um, and, and a surprising number of jurisdictions are going to the furthest extent, which is saying it can be a chosen family member or an alternative to that is you can designate one non-family member per year who you can take leave for. Oh, Marge, it's our favorite. We have a pop-in <laughs> slide. Um, as we progress these, I do want to note, I ha I've seen the questions come in and we will address some questions at the end of this presentation. So, um, so just keep that in mind. Feel free to add your questions to the Q&A tab. Um, this is a state of the nation in regard to paid family and medical leave. So the states in purple have programs up and running with benefits being paid. The states in green have passed PFML laws, um, but benefits are not yet being paid. Connecticut, the premiums have begun being deducted from um, employee pay. Uh, the states in blue are states where we've seen PFML proposals. So they're certainly not going to pass in all these states, but it is a significant volume of states that are evaluating legislation on paid family medical leave. Um, and the states uh, in gray, we've yet to see um, any legislative activity. So just to note, um, you know, what is paid family medical leave? I spoke about this a little bit, but they're paid benefits. Um, they usually vary state to state and they pay an employee a portion of their salary if they're out for certain uh, covered leave reasons. Often those leave reasons um, mirror the FMLA leave reasons and maybe include a few additional reasons such as the employee's status as a victim of crime, um, so, so they can vary state to state. And right now there's no federal solution. So a ton of state activity here. So this is another uh, way of looking at the activity. Uh, this chart um, in the left-hand column are the states that have some type of PFML program. Uh, all of those states, except for Hawaii, do both the family and the medical. Hawaii currently only has the medical, the disability only. The states in the teal colored are states that have laws, they just haven't, the leaves haven't yet begun under them. If you get into the middle column, you may be surprised to know there's a federal tax credit for paid family and medical leave. It's worth checking out. Initially, it was just there year to year. Now it's there until 2025. And there is a suggestion by the Internal Revenue Service that if you offer short-term disability, you may be eligible for this tax credit. So it may be something that is worth talking to your accountant about. Um, I want to draw your attention to the, to the middle bottom column about government employees. At the end of 2019, the federal government um, adopted legislation that created 12 weeks of fully paid parental leave for most federal employees. It was, it was really quite a huge change. And so in the first couple of months of 2020, you saw a lot of states doing the same thing, saying, well, we're going to do this for our employees. And I actually thought 2020 was going to be the year where PFML kind of came into its own, that this trend in the government employees would spread to the private employees, at least for paid parental leave. And then COVID hit <laughs> and everything shut down. But look at in 2020, all of those laws that were introduced were introduced before early March. That just shows you how active it was. Well, what's happened in 2021 is that lots of states have introduced laws. Um, I, I think of COVID as kind of being cruel in many ways. And one way is that it's highlighted for many people how important paid family and medical leave is. You know, people really see um, in given what's happening with COVID, how important it is. But it's also left a lot of states broke. And so while there was a lot of um, interest in paid family and medical leave, there just there was not the, the fiscal reality there for these laws to pass. Hawaii and Maine have, um, it, Maine's is pending, but they are very interested in moving to the next step for the paid family and medical leave. They're requiring a study and going to require that it be reported on. I, I think potentially 2022, if the economy continues to pick up, we could see more activity. And then we're going to talk about the federal proposals that are there. There's been a lot of chatter about whether there's going to be a federal paid family and medical leave program. So uh, what we've seen recently is that Hawaii has passed a law to study paid family medical leave and Maine is likely to pass one too. It's pending right now. Um, one of the items that we've been seeing at the state level is a, a trend in um, forward thinking, uh, especially and also re related to COVID thinking to include leave for public health emergency. 
Um, so we saw that happen in New Jersey, um, and, and we think that COVID opened a lot of eyes to the to, to the, the the opportunity that we may face another public health emergency, and that we need leave in order to stem the spread of a of a pandemic. Um, there's also a, a sort of legislative trend to add the opportunity to take leave for a victim of crime. And most often what we see is domestic violence victims um, or so that there'd be an opportunity if you had an employee who was a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, or sex trafficking to be able to uh, have a job protected leave from work to step away to do things like file a police report, um, you know, uh, move uh, potentially themselves or their children, uh, seek medical health, seek counseling, et cetera. Um, we've also seen a new trend in offering time for bereavement. Right now, um, there's only one state that has the opportunity to take um, bereavement leave, and it's an unpaid leave law in Illinois. Um, and then we've seen some legislation that would add a leave reason for the death of a newborn child or, or a stillbirth. Whoops. Sorry. Didn't Fine. mean to do that, Abby. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Um, I was trying to deal with it not turning, and I turned too quickly. So let's talk about the federal program. Um, President Biden has announced a very general proposal. There are not a lot of details around it, um, but he is proposing paid family and medical leave, sort of the whole thing, bonding with a new child, taking care of a serious ill family member. He adds in the issues related to stalking and domestic violence, military exigency, which is an FMLA uh, type of leave, and your own illness. And then interestingly, death, uh, they, they are adding in some bereavement leave. They have not released the details, but they're planning to phase it in. So there will be 12 weeks of leave by year 10. Uh, they, what they've suggested is maybe the first year it would be eight weeks of parental, four weeks of family, two weeks for your own medical. They do want to get in three days of bereavement starting with year one. Um, the interesting thing about this proposal is it's not going to be funded by a payroll tax on either employers or employees. Part of Biden's uh, proposition for a lot of things he's doing is that the wealthy are going to pay for it. And so it's going to be paid for by taxes on those whose incomes are $400,000 or higher. Um, and the benefit will be up to $4,000 per month. And there is going to be the very broad definition of family member, including chosen family. So Biden's proposal is pretty broad and loosey-goosey. It's got its general structure. Um, the Ways and Means Committee has actually released a proposal. Um, Chairman Richie Neal has released one. And, and theirs has a very high level of detail and very specific uh, benefit tiering amounts. Um, but but their, the Ways and uh, Means Committee proposal would provide up to 60 days um, in a 12 month period, but a maximum of 20 in any specific month. Um, he, I'm not gonna go through every detail of it. I'm, I'm sure there'll be many changes, but one of the interesting things about it is that it contemplates the existence of statutory disability and paid family medical leave programs today, like the ones that exist in states like New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, California, et cetera. Um, and, and so it, 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 it contemplates that and, and contemplates how legacy plans would be handled. It also contemplates uh, private plans. So for employers who, who today have plans in place, there's an opportunity to be reimbursed for existing programs. Um, they could be reimbursed up to 40% if the employer program provides leave for all the same covered reasons and up to 28% if they provide leave for at least one of the covered reasons. Um, like the Biden plan, there'll be no payroll tax and this is gonna be paid for um, by a tax on the wealthy. So we'll see if either are successful. I'm not quite sure uh, there's strong odds either way that these will pass. So um, I've been surprised throughout COVID how much of an interest there is by employers in um, adding on paid leave, uh, whether it's paid parental or paid family. Um, and so we actually, we got so many questions about it. We designed a, a takeaway that you can get from us that talks about different types of plan design issues, some of them legal, some of them not. So if that is something that is of interest to you, you're welcome to get it. So now we're gonna move on to an update on federal and state leave and accommodation law changes that do not uh, directly involve COVID. Um, so the first is uh, an, a USERA amendment. Um, USERA is a reemployment right um, 
that is given to um, service members. And uh, what has happened is effective January 5th, it was amended to include coverage for members of the National Guard who are performing certain types of duty under state authority. Um, it also will provide um, a, uh, some coverage for uh, in members uh, who are serving for 14 days or more to support a national emergency declared by the president or in support of a major disaster declared by the president. Um, so this is an important expansion of USERA. Um, and I know that the, you know, the National Guard was activated, particularly after the, um, the Capitol riot. Um, so it's, you know, it's interesting and it's a law that hasn't been amended in a long time. So something to be aware of. Oregon's had some significant changes. Uh, they have, I'm not sure if Kate Brown has signed it yet. I, I imagine that she will, but they are permanently adopting this public health emergency leave under their unpaid family act, OFLA. It's one of the abbreviations I love to say the most, OFLA. Uh, so employer, employers, employees in that state who have children whose school or place of care is closed are now going to be eligible for up to 12 weeks. Oregon also has, they, they are one of the states that has a paid family, a medical leave program that is sort of underway, but they have uh, introduced legislation to somewhat delay the implementation. Um, they're gonna put off the premium contributions by one year and then put off the leaves by nine months. That has passed the house. Uh, we're, not, we're not entirely sure whether it will ultimately pass. So Washington um, PFML is a newer program that the benefits became available 1-1-2020 forward. And they actually amended their law and they provide the opportunity to take leave even when the employee didn't meet the, what they call the hours worked requirement um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So obviously a lot of employers were shut down and so people were not potentially working the schedules that they had regularly worked. And in Washington, um, you have to have worked 820 hours in the year preceding the leave to qualify. And so um, they, they implemented this kind of look back period to say, well, if you worked 820 hours during the first through fourth quarter of 2019 or the second through um, fourth quarter of 2019 and first quarter of 2020, then we will consider that you are eligible for Mass Washington, um, Washington PFML. Um, so, and there's some more details here about grants that are available to smaller employers under this mandate. Um, employers and private plans are actually not eligible um, for the employer assistance grants. Another interesting amendment to Washington's paid family medical leave law is that they expanded the definition of family member. And this is a legislative trend that we're seeing. And what they did is they provided the opportunity to take leave to care for someone who's an individual who resides with the employee and where their relationship creates an expectation that the employee would care for that individual or that that individual depends on the employee for care. So it's, it's kind of a chosen family extension or it is a chosen family extension. Um, and, and they try to soften it by, by saying it's, it's, there has to be that expectation of care. So it couldn't just be a roommate off Craigslist that you just moved in with, I don't think would qualify, but it'll be interesting to see how it's implemented and how, how and if they actually ask questions or try to certify that relationship or document that relationship. So there's been sort of a mishmash of other changes. Uh, some of them I'm gonna to refer to as nothing burgers. Um, so New York has expanded its family member definition to include sibling. Uh, Maine is, is, has expanded, the governor actually just signed it, it's unpaid uh, family leave act to include caring for a grandchild, Grand, caring for a grandparent had already been covered, but now caring for a grandchild is covered. Maryland adopted essential worker leave, um, but this, this truly is a nothing burger right now because it only becomes effective when there's federal or state funding to pay for the leave because it's paid leave and there is no funding. So it's a law that's there, but I'm not sure it offers much. And then Maryland also uh, passed a law to require employers who have 15 or more employees that if they allow, if they have paid leave, they have to let employees use it for bereavement. So this is a big old nothing burger, as Marge would say. Um, <laughs> so Pennsylvania passed a living donor law that essentially says if you're eligible for FMLA, 
um, and you're in a, you work for an employer um, who's covered by the FMLA, you can take up to 12 weeks for the purposes of donating an organ or tissue. Um, why this is nothing burger is that the US Department of Labor has already issued an opinion letter saying that organ donation, um, surgery and recovery therefrom would qualify as a serious health condition under the FMLA. So this doesn't really provide any additional time that would already be available to employees under the FMLA. So, um, so I don't know that I want to call the Indiana pregnancy accommodation law a complete nothing burger, but, um, but it sounds better than it is. How's that? Uh, it <laughs> says that an employee can request in writing an accommodation related to pregnancy, childbirth, or any related medical condition. And then if the employee does do that, the employer has to respond within a reasonable period of time. But the law goes out of its way to say, the employer is not required to provide an accommodation under this law, that the duty to provide will be determined by other laws that are out there. Um, the employee who requests the accommodation is protected from discipline or retaliation. And again, another employer favorable aspect is that the attempt to accommodate or failure to accommodate is not itself considered disciplinary or retaliatory. Um, and then Connecticut did pass a law that has, has some teeth in terms of providing um, additional space and accommodations for women who are breastfeeding. So I'd say this is probably also not a nothing burger. Um, there is a, a federal proposal for, for the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. And what this would do is it would apply to employers with 15 or more and all public sector employers. And it would require that reasonable accommodations are made for pregnant employees and applicants who have known limitations related to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, um, as long as providing the reasonable accommodation would not result in an undue hardship to the employer. Um, so there's a ton of uh, a body of law of state level pregnancy accommodation laws, and this would be a federal level law that sort of you know, sets a federal standard, um, and it does have a good chance of passing. So Virginia had um, some interesting changes. Uh, the, the one that has some, some of us insurance carriers a little perplexed is there was a change to their disability insurance law that said starting 7121, that if you issue a short-term disability policy in Virginia that provides coverage for disability arising out of childbirth, then you have to have the benefit immediately available for at least 12 weeks after childbirth. So we were confused when this was adopted. The sponsor thought that she was essentially mandating 12 weeks of paid leave after childbirth. The law didn't read that way. The law clearly requires proof of disability, but it does have that word immediately in there. And so we have been advised by the Bureau of Insurance that you cannot have a waiting period after childbirth. Now that doesn't mean that you can't have one if somebody becomes disabled during pregnancy. Uh, so it's, it's all a little convoluted and it only affects new policies issued in Virginia <laughs> on or after July 1st. Now the second Virginia law to me, this was a surprise. I did not know that Virginia did not have a law that prohibited discrimination on the basis of disability. Well, they do now. Um, and it's, it's one of, I would say, the tougher ones, including it's got very extensive notice requirements. So if you have employees in Virginia, you're going to want to take note of that, um, particularly those notice requirements, which not only require posting, but you actually have to give the employee individual notice once they tell you within a certain amount of time, 10 days of when they told you they had a disability. So uh, Kentucky has amended, their, they have an adoption law that mandates uh, six weeks of leave be given to employees who adopt a child under the age of seven. Uh, this was amended in March and um, it, it requires that employers who provide parental leave uh, to the birth parent provide the same amount of leave to an adoptive parent. And it also increases the age of adoption um, to provide the benefit or the, the leave benefit to employees who adopt a child age 10 or younger. So now the fun part of the session, we're gonna review some actual jury trials and settlements that have happened in 2021. Um, interesting that 2020 was not a very active um, period of time, but 2021, the courts seemed to be getting back in action. 
So the first one is talking about a jury trial that happened at a federal court in Washington. It was a Zoom jury trial, which I think is really interesting. I, I think I, I would love to actually try to get get in touch with people involved in the trial to see how it went. It's probably was a risky thing, both sides thought, doing a Zoom jury trial. The employee worked as a long distance truck driver. Um, and when he revealed that he had limitations from knee surgeries, the employee removed him from driving, even though he, his doctor had said that he was safe to drive. Um, and then the employer wouldn't let him back to work, uh, it continued to express concerns about the safety. There was evidence introduced at trial that the employer was unhappy that he had been vocally <laughs> vocal about his concerns that they were not open to taking care of issues related to disabilities. So as you can see, huge jury verdict, um, you know, $7 million. It was reduced by statute down to 2 million for the punitive damages, a um, million dollars in attorney's fees uh, and another $47,000 in litigation expenses. So, so that was an expensive lesson. I, I don't know if it means that if you're an employer, maybe a Zoom trial is a good idea. I'm not sure what you can take away from that, but it was an interesting result. The, the next case is interesting in that uh, there was a an settlement um, it, with ongoing consent decree. So it's a reminder that sometimes it's not just the loss if you lose the case or you have a settlement, but that there could be continuing obligations um, on the employer. So in this case, the employee had was a longstanding employee and he, has, he was older and he was hoping to retire from the company. He took leave for heart surgery. He was released to return to work. Um, but when he did, the managers were fearful of his condition and they restricted him and they actually fired him within nine days of his return to work. Um, so there's a $100,000 settlement and then a two-year consent decree, um, which requires that the employer um, has to get rid of their 100% healed policy. Um, so they cannot require employees to be released without restrictions. Uh, those are tricky policies anyway to uphold these days. Um, it required mandatory training for the uh, personnel um, and employees, and it requires the employer to report disability discrimination complaints to the EEOC. So that just shows you there can, you know, sometimes it's not just the settlement money, but it's the lingering, you know, controls and obligations. So uh, the next case involves a hospital. Uh, two employees sued. Only one of the claims was ADA related. The employee had migraines. She got, had accommodations, got them for a long time. Um, but interestingly, some of the accommodations included time off from work and the hospital never notified her of her FMLA rights. That time off would have been covered by the FMLA. So um, I, that struck me as interesting because I, as an employment attorney, I, I've seen that happen where managers don't realize that the reason they're letting the employee take time off is FMLA covered and they can run into a situation where they haven't given the notice. Then another thing that happens a lot in the employment world is a new CEO came in um, and he really didn't want, uh, he started giving lots of extra work to the employee who had the migraines that caused her to have migraines. She wanted time off. Eventually he became very unhappy with it and, term and fired her. There ended up being a settlement um, for both of the employees. Um, hers was the larger settlement of the two because she had the disability claim. So in this uh, next case, when we look at, um, I think the lesson here is that while you don't have to grant unlimited leave, you know, beyond, as an accommodation beyond the FMLA, if there's a definite period of leave and the person is expected to return back to work, the employer should really take that under consideration. So this case involved an employee who had, who had a long tenure and had a series of health conditions, uh, afflicted by a series of health conditions, but he did have a, you know, expected return to work date and he was terminated and um, he actually was able to eventually return to work for another employer, but at a lower uh, salary. And in any event, they found for the employee to the tune of slightly over half a million dollars plus attorney's fees. So uh, this, case, this next case involved an employee who had um, Morton's neuroma and difficulty walking. She was approved to work from home for three weeks. 
But the day after she went out, she was placed on an unpaid leave while they reviewed her accommodation. She was told to stop working from home. They cut off her access to the employer email and the systems. She did submit a second healthcare provider note uh, recommending telework and the manager denied the request and suspended her benefits. And so she went to the EEOC um, to raise her concerns and there ended up being one of these settlements where um, nobody's admitting or denying liability, but they're paying a certain amount. And then they're also agreeing to one of these lengthy consent decrees where they have to make reports and do everything else. And last but not least, uh, this last case that we're going to look at um, involved a property manager who had a great record um, and had been a very successful employee. She had an injury. She was out of work. During the time she was out of work, no work got done. They just piled everything she had been doing on her desk so that when she returned, her desk was covered in things to do. Um, she was a property manager. Things had fallen into disrepair. Nobody had been upkeeping her obligations. And so then they put her on a performance plan saying that she had fallen behind and she had to do all of these things. She nearly caught completely up. They had some problems securing a landscaper. Um, and you know, ultimately she was terminated for poor performance, you know, shortly after returning from her leave. Um, and you know, as you can see, the employer lost on that case to the tune of 278000 And I know, I think Brianna was gonna jump in and potentially ask some questions that we've gotten in the Q&A. Yep. Um, so the first one is, can our company require that temporary employees provide proof of vaccination and what is considered proof of vaccination? Both are great questions. Uh, I think the EEOC has indicated in its guidance um, although the EEOC only really controls direct employees, although temporary employees are often considered joint employees. So you are able to ask not only temporary employees, but other visitors to show proof of vaccination. What is proof in the U.S. is, is interesting. If somebody had a vaccination card, I think that would suffice. If they had a note from their doctor verifying they had been vaccinated, I think that would be sufficient. Um, we, we will, uh, I think Sun Life may be leaning towards asking for proof of vaccination at some point. So, you know, ask me this question again in 60 days and I'll, pro I'll probably have a number of, of stories to tell you about proof of vaccination. But um, I think that that could be tricky. I think that's one of the concerns that people have is that there, there isn't really sort of an easy way to prove it. Okay. Um, another one was when you're talking about COVID leaves, how do these programs work with a paid time off program? Abby, you want to take that? How do these work with a paid time off program? It could be state to state specific, um, but potentially if there's a mandate in your paid time off program is more generous than the mandate, there may be an opportunity to satisfy the mandate. It really just depends on that the particular law in which you're operating under and whether or not it's a requirement of an additional time or supplemental time to, an ex to existing PTO, or it's just a requirement that you are enabling them to use the time and that it can run concurrent with paid time off. Yeah, I'll just add to that. What we saw with COVID, particularly in the beginning, was a lot of it was supplemental. It was, there were, including the FFCRA said, you can't force employees to use other time they might have. I think people really realized this was a crisis and people needed extra time. Um, but it is going to vary. And I think potentially as we get further out from the pandemic, it may run more concurrently with paid time off that exists. Now, if you, I think some of these laws also said that if your employer had a supplemental emergency allotment of leave, that could count, but not the regular PTO. Okay, I think we can squeeze one more question in if that's okay. Um, so this question came in when you were talking about sick leave. How has COVID and work from home policies affected employees who live in a different city or county from where their office is located? That's a great question. And Marge, I guess I'll start with the IRS case where New, New, the state of New Hampshire has sued uh, the state of Massachusetts over this issue. Um, because in Massachusetts, when COVID first broke out, there was guidance given that if you have an employee who's working out of state just temporarily due to COVID, they should keep paying into the mass PFML program. And the state of New Hampshire said, we don't think so. <laughs> we don't think they should be paying to Massachusetts if they're up here living and working out of New Hampshire. So the case is actually going to be heard in front of the Supreme Court. 
And I think we'll have much better guidance uh, from there because right now it is, it is, there is no solid answer. Marge, would you add anything to that? I think it could ultimately affect the economic fate of different jurisdictions. I think there's going to be winners and losers to the extent New York City, for example, uh, has a lot of people who no longer work in New York City or even New York State. And the laws say, well, if you're if you're home for good, not just because of COVID, if you're now working from home, you need to pay taxes into the state where you reside. Um, that's going to have in public policy impacts. So it will be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Do you want to do one more? Sure. I think this is a simple one. <laughs> Um, this is when you're speaking about paid family medical leave. Um, does the federal leave program apply to companies of all sizes? Does the, fed, the federal programs? Yes. Was, I, Marge, I do think that they would apply to all size employers. The fe which federal programs are we talking about? Are we talking about the American Rescue Plan? Are we talking about COVID or the new plans? I believe this is the new plans. The new plans. I think it would apply to all. There may be different requirements in terms of um, job protection and funding. I, I do know that there is a lot of sensitivity to smaller employers at the federal level and recognition that they're in a different vantage point. But I also, on the flip side of that, I also know that there's a lot of attention on employees for smaller employers who need leave. Um, and haven't been able to get it. I think that's one of the hopes of a federal program is that smaller employers, it'll be more affordable for them. In fact, they under these programs, they won't be paying anything. It'll, as we say, it'll be free sort of. Um, so I, I think that's all gonna have to be hashed out in the legislature. When the, the Family and Medical Leave Act was adopted back in 1993, uh, people were really worried the economy was going to collapse from this law. And so it is one of the reasons that it is limited to employers with 50 or more employees. So we may start to see some of the same concerns being raised with regard to the paid family leave. All right. Well, thank you, especially for those who have hung in there through this sort of wrap at the end. Um, we want to thank you very much. We do hope that we will see you in, in at least six months. Um, as I mentioned before, we are trying to do these quarterly, but we, we do have day jobs as well. But we this is this is the most fun thing we do. So we hope to be back soon.